disaster investigator. In the past 10 years, I've either worked on or helped advise investigations into the Space Shuttle Columbia accident, the reconstruction of Iraq, railway safety, WMD terrorism, and Hurricane Sandy. What this means is that you never, ever want to see me in your office. If I am working for you, you have really big problems. But the truth is, we all face disaster and crisis together. It's a fact of our world. It's the flip side of all the complexity around us. Systems are going to fail. That's the easy part. The hard part turns out to be learning from disaster. Today, I'm going to share a story of catastrophic failure and talk about why learning from disaster is key to our future security and prosperity. The story begins on the morning of February 1st, 2003. High above the Pacific Ocean, the crew of the Space Shuttle Columbia, including Indian American astronaut Casey Chavla, are strapping in and donning their flight suits and preparing for re-entry. This is video of their descent. It may look calm in that shuttle cockpit, but that space shuttle is traveling at 25 times the speed of sound. That's Bangalore to Chennai in 60 seconds. And that's not lightning that you see outside the shuttle window. That's superheated atmospheric particles called plasma sliming into the shuttle, heating it up. Reentry is so violent that the winds of the shuttle heat up to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The reentry proceeded normally until 8.54 a.m. It was at that moment that several sensors started to fail on the shuttle. Soon thereafter, master's, master alarm sounded in the cockpit and NASA lost communications with the crew. Six minutes after the first sign of trouble, residents of central Texas heard a crackling boom. This is video of the breakup. The Columbia came apart at 200,000 feet. There were no survivors. This is also where I joined the story. This is me next to the shuttle Discovery at the Kennedy Space Center. I'd always wanted to be that close to a space shuttle. When I was a kid, I dreamed of being an astronaut. I even learned how to fly. Turns out my vision wasn't good enough for flight training. So I did the next best thing. I went to Harvard. It turned out to be an awful decision. Twice the homework, not nearly as much fun. Instead of rocket off into space, I rocket off every morning to the office. When I first joined the Space Shuttle Columbia investigation, all of us on the investigation observed what you might call the first rule of investigations. And that rule is that NASA should not investigate itself. It's not that people at NASA are untrustworthy, it's just that people from the outside can often take better measure of the situation. We also follow the second rule of investigations. Never know less than those you're investigating. NASA is full of brilliant rocket scientists, so the board collected a bunch of its own, eventually growing its staff to 140 people. In the beginning, those of us in the investigation were really unsure whether the physical cause would ever be found. Most of the shuttle had burnt up upon re-entry, and what little was left of it was spread over a debris field of 1,000 miles. It took our engineers months to find out what had happened, but eventually the story of the accident's physical cause began to emerge. At 81.9 seconds after launch, a small piece of insulating foam popped off the orange fuel tank of the shuttle and smashed into the wing. When NASA engineers first took a look at this video, they weren't worried. Foam had caught off the shuttle many times before and had never caused a serious problem to flight safety. Our investigation, however, found out something different. Our investigation found that that day, when that piece of foam came off, it slammed into the wing and caused a gaping hole. The physical strike of that foam hitting the wing was like throwing a basketball across the court at 500 miles an hour. The foam just didn't hit any part in the shuttle. It hit the most vulnerable part, the part that has to withstand the highest heat during re-entry. When we knew this, we knew what had caused the accident. As the Columbia began to re-enter the Earth, the plasma that you saw flashing outside the windows entered the left wing through the hole. This is a picture taken as the shuttle was traveling over New Mexico just before it began to break up. You can see here that the left wing is already beginning to deform. It eventually collapsed, sending the shuttle into a fatal spin. The astronauts never had a chance. Now, if this were an ordinary accident investigation, it'd be over. The physical cause was found, and it would be up to NASA to find a fix for it. But this is where the Columbia investigation 
invented what should be the third rule of all investigations. Don't just stop with how the accident happened, the physical cause. Figure out why it happened. There, there are tons of very educated safety engineers at NASA. How is it that something so elementary slipped past them? Put another way, what caused the physical cause? It was at this point that the Spatial Columbia investigation began its second phase. That phase was focused on NASA's organization and safety culture, and what we found was fascinating. The first thing that we found is that there was a long history to following foam strikes on the shuttle. In the very beginning of the shuttle program, engineers were very concerned about foam strikes causing a very serious threat to flight safety. They tried to fix the falling foam, but inevitably, as you can see from this chart, every mission, and some missions, a lot of foam would come off, but every mission there would always be some. What happened at NASA is that over time, the safety engineers became comfortable with certain amounts of foam loss. Foam loss began to be interpreted as a sign that the shuttle was behaving normally. This is what the sociologist Diane Vaughn calls the normalization of deviance. NASA got used to a risk. There was something else going on at NASA. NASA was rushing to complete the space station. The International Space Station in 2003 was way over budget and behind schedule. The US Congress was not happy, and NASA was under a lot of pressure to get it right. So in part to help everybody stay on schedule, NASA headquarters emailed this computer screensaver to shuttle engineers. Shuttle managers, every day in front of their computer, were greeted with a display that told them how many days, hours, minutes, and seconds they had to go before the job was done. In this atmosphere, no one had time to think about foam. Something else further was going on. The shuttle is a dangerous experimental technology flying at the limits of engineering. But NASA, over time, had begun to treat it more like a space airplane. NASA had become like any other organization that trades off safety, schedule, and cost. The situation was a little bit like this cartoon. The Space Shuttle Columbia investigation found that the root problem at NASA wasn't the foam, it was a broken safety culture. It was the broken safety culture at NASA that led NASA to continue launching shuttles despite potentially catastrophic foam loss. It's what led NASA engineers, when they first saw the video of the foam strike, to believe that there might not be a, th a threat to flight safety. It's what led NASA to silence the voices of several engineers who thought the astronauts were in danger and might need to be rescued. And tragically, it's what led, by the counts of the investigation, to nine missed opportunities to discover the, ch the damage and rescue the astronauts. Now, what happened, what happened at NASA is not unique. The dynamics of complex systems and the disasters that sometimes they cause are present in many other places around us, in the financial system, in offshore oil exploration, and in our institutions of national security. All complex systems share at least two properties in common. The first property is called tight coupling. It means a failure in one part of the system can quickly cascade into another part. A very dramatic example of tight coupling happened in my home state of Ohio in 2003. A single high-tension power line came into contact with overgrown trees. It shorted, and before engineers had any idea what had happened, 256 power plants came offline, plunging the East Coast and Midwest into darkness. It turns out the U.S. electrical grid was far more tightly coupled than anyone imagined. A second property of complex systems is called interactive complexity. Many times, components, and particularly subcomponents, will interact in completely unexpected ways that you can't always anticipate. This happened in the 1979 nuclear disaster at Three Mile Island. A single cup of water leaked in a secondary cooling system, causing the pumps to shut down, which then caused emergency pumps to shut on. But then, the primary, secondary, and emergency cooling system started to interact in unexpected ways. Before engineers could figure out how the system was actually behaving, a partial nuclear meltdown occurred. Interactive complexity happens in even more mundane situations than that. Vin Cerf is one of two engineers who founded the internet. He tried to email me a few months ago, and the servers at my office rejected his email. You know you're in trouble when the person who invented the internet can't use it to send email. But this is the world we live in, with complexity around us at every level, and systems interacting in unexpected ways, and in, that are in ways that are tightly coupled to one another. In fact, the internet is perhaps the most complex system ever devised. What makes today's internet different is all the devices that are now linked to it. The Internet of Things, as we call it, comprises hundreds of millions of devices and also tens of thousands of industrial control systems. The dynamics that cause danger and disaster are more present in a system like this. These dynamics 
also drive our security. This is the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff trying on Google Glasses. Google Glasses are really cool, but the microelectronics that drive them are also fueling a far more deadly era in warfare. In fact, we've now arrived at something we call the security paradox. On the one hand, our world is safer and more peaceful than it's ever been before. In fact, in evolutionary terms, as the Harvard professor Steven Pinker is fond of pointing out, our race has never experienced lower rates of violence. That's the good news. Here's the bad news. That technology I talked about, well, it's also fueling the ability of small groups to be incredibly lethal. This is a chart showing how much damage a small group of people can do over time. As you can see, we're not living today on the right side of the curve. This is where what we've learned about disaster connects with our security environment. It's not just that smaller groups of people can cause tremendous harm, it's that the complex systems that power our cities and our economies and also protect us are themselves vulnerable to failure. So in this world that we live in, how do we learn from failure? How do we strive to prevent disaster and make our world a safer place? Well, I'd offer three suggestions. The first is just to recognize the inherent properties of complex systems. When you see complexity, you might think that someday we could build the perfect system that would never break down. Well, think again. And being prepared to anticipate surprise will help us prepare for it. The second lesson is that disasters are themselves opportunities to learn from. But that learning is not going to happen automatically. It turns out that no one likes to be investigated. Not NASA, not operators of nuclear power plants, not any one of us. So if you're a country or a company that doesn't have an independent tradition of investigation, you should start one. The third lesson is the most important of all. The third lesson is to not just stop with how accidents occurred, but to seek out that why, why they occurred. You have to walk back the causal chain. You might have a problem with falling foam, or you might have a problem with your management culture rushing to launch. You won't know until you take that walk. And the other lesson to learn there is that it's not just about the technology. It's about the humans that are around the technology. You might fix the technology and have a human problem, so you also have to fix the humans too. If you obey those three lessons, you will never see me in your office. Thank you.